a new way we work from Fast Company Magazine, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor, Kate Davis. Most of us are fed a narrative of the standard path to success from a very young age. Work hard, do well in school, go to college, get a career. But we already know that that narrative is flawed and that the chances of success are skewed to those with a host of privileges that are often outside of our control. Still, higher education as an assumption along a career path is something that for most Americans is not a given. In fact, over 60% of Americans don't have a college degree. Over the last generations, college has become even more unobtainable. Tuitions have increased by over 140% at colleges and universities, and recent studies have found that the majority of parents, 64%, would be supportive if their children did not want to get a college degree. And yet, a bachelor's degree is still listed as a minimum requirement for most professional positions, and hiring pipelines and many major companies are filled with the alumni of the same set of prestigious universities. So what's the real purpose of college? Will these sets of standards and assumptions about the educational divide ever change? And what is the professional world like for someone without a college degree? I think for someone who didn't have the experience and someone who interacts day to day with mostly people who are college educated, to me, what sticks out the most is not necessarily that they quote unquote know more than I do, but that they have had this experience that I didn't have. And A lot of it has to do with networking and the friends you meet and the person you decide you're going to be. That's my colleague, Christopher Zara. He's a senior editor of the news section at Fast Company. Before Fast Company, he was a deputy editor at International Business Times. He's the author of a new book, Uneducated, a memoir of flunking out, falling apart, and finding my worth. The book is an honest look at what it's like to try to enter an elite industry without a college degree. I asked him about the various forms of gatekeepers prospective employees encounter before they can get an interview. I would just say for me, for my own experience in particular, these applicant tracking systems that really kind of took hold probably a decade or so ago were detrimental in job searches. For someone without a traditional education, you literally couldn't get through these filters that employers set up. And now I don't think it was intentional on the part of employers to necessarily filter out workers who had the skills to perform the job they were looking for. I think it was partially a way of kind of winnowing down the applicant pool to begin with, because, the you know, these, these applicant pools do get pretty large. To answer your question about what employers could do, I think one thing to do is just start there. Look at these uh, applicant tracking systems that you have in place and ask yourself if the job you're trying to fill really requires that graduate degree or that bachelor's degree or another piece of information or or educational component that um, could easily be removed from the filtering. You might find yourself with a whole new pool of applicants. Yeah, I think you're right. And after reading your book, I thought, oh, God, if you don't use the applicant tracking systems, even just in your job postings, minimum bachelor's degree is just kind of always there and it's there by a default without thinking of it. I think employers use it maybe as a shorthand to be like, you have studied for some sort of skills, but so often the people don't actually use their degree. Whatever they studied in college is not necessarily the job that they're applying for. So what does it actually mean? Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, I do understand why that employers do it. I do think it's changing a little bit now with the the awareness of this issue. When you're dealing with people face to face, there's often the chance to be able to explain your background in a in a more nuanced way where the applicant tracking systems won't even allow you to get through, but in in my own case there there were a few times when I did get through to a human being, sometimes HR, sometimes a hiring manager. They they might ask me about my lack of a college education, and I would explain my situation, and often that would at least get me the interview. I think the situation we have now is because there's a lot less face-to-face interaction. There's just a lot more automation in the job hiring process. It makes it a little bit more difficult for applicants with non-traditional backgrounds. Yeah, and it's it's trying to, you know, save time and, and weed out people that, you know, don't have the relevant skills, but again, you're not tracking for skills. You're 
tracking for, you know, it's, it's a shorthand that doesn't always work. And you certainly can't then see things like transferable skills from other industries or other experiences. Yeah, totally. So you talk a lot in the book about feeling at a disadvantage because you didn't know the same things that your coworkers knew. And I totally <laughs> like related <laughs> to a lot of the like secret Googling of like, what does that mean? And you said that you kind of felt like you didn't fit in. And you mentioned at one point in the book that you had slash maybe still have a fascination with office culture, which I thought was really interesting, you know, because it's like you didn't have that background. Many of our colleagues and my colleagues at previous jobs over the years have gone to these top universities, but they didn't actually study journalism. They have law degrees or, you know, other degrees. How much of the value of a college degree is not actually about the degree itself? It's about a lot of things. I think for someone who didn't have the experience and someone who interacts day to day with mostly people who are college educated, to me, what sticks out the most is not necessarily that they quote unquote know more than I do, but that they have had this experience that I didn't have. And a lot of it has to do with networking and the friends you meet and the person you decide you're going to be. And I think education continues to shape people's identity even after they leave school, long after they, they leave school, obviously. It's such an obvious conversation starter. I think I also <laughs> write in the book about going on some dates when I first moved to the city and how that was just a conversation you couldn't avoid. People ask you where you went to school, especially if you were working in the media industry, they assume you did. And it wasn't, there was no malicious intent behind it. It's just a natural thing for people to talk about. I think where I felt mostly different is in not having those experiences. And I think the reason I, I was fascinated by office culture was because I came to it so late. I didn't work in an office until I was in my mid-30s. And before that, I'd been in retail and just sort of, you know, wandering, <laughs> wandering the earth in this sort of weird um, limbo bohemia state. So when I finally got into an office, I found it fascinating and I wanted to be a part of it. And I, and I wanted to use that to shape my own identity. I wanted what I did to be who I am. Yeah. Well, that's a big part of it, too. I mean, there's so much there. There's like there's one I do believe and I agree with you so much. I feel like the power of a college degree in a lot of instances, especially in these it feels weird to say it, but like elite industries are the networking that comes from it. Yeah. I did go to college, but I went to a state school with no alumni network to speak of. And when I moved to New York to start working in journalism, I didn't have any connections. And this is how we get the homogeny of hiring, right? Is like, oh, who do we know? I'll reach out to my alumni network. And like everybody went to the same four schools. The office culture is interesting because it wasn't my background either. And I guess for other people, maybe it's just like being in this kind of professional world and your identity with your job is just kind of a natural part of growing up and you see what your parents do. And for somebody, you know, like coming from the outside, it is kind of like a code switching, like a culture shock. Yeah, definitely. And I and I understand like, you know, there's this sort of reevaluation of the way we view our work lives that's happening, I think now. And I think for good reasons. Defining yourself by your job is not necessarily the most healthy way to look at life, I don't think. I think it's it's one part of an equation and certainly shouldn't be the whole part. But in my early experience, it definitely was something that I aspired to. I, I went to these mixers with uh, real journalists for the first time in my life, and I put on the little the little plastic badges that they give you. And I just felt like I had arrived, you know, because I was like mingling with real professionals, something that I had never been able to do before. Yeah. And it gives you this kind of shorthand of legitimacy. Like when you have fast company on your networking badge, then people suddenly take you seriously in a way that they wouldn't have before, even though you're the same person with the same knowledge and the same experience, but attaching yourself in a professional way to a brand. And I think that is where a lot of, you know, as you say, we're kind of more healthfully moving away from that. But like, where your identity gets especially tied up to a prestigious employer. Yeah, totally. So we're talking about kind of how a degree helps people get their foot in the door, how you get past these gatekeepers. You know, it all kind of comes down to a person deciding to take a chance on you or not. But do you think that a college degree still matters as much as it did 10 or 20 years ago when you were grappling with not having one and how you could get into the professional world? Yeah, I mean, are we talking about journalism in particular? Yeah, let's talk journalism, but then let's also talk kind of the wider world, because I know we have been covering on Fast Company about Gen Z kind of not valuing a college degree as much as, as previous yeah. generations. Yeah. yeah, 
So yeah, I think in the case of journalism, it's a good question and I don't really know the answer. I think there's been some survey data on the statistics about people who work in media and their educational background. I don't think there's a lot of good data for the last few years, but definitely the statistics are clear that something like over 90% of working journalists had at least a bachelor's degree. I think since COVID, there's been a bit of a reevaluation of that sort of bare minimum qualification. So I think it's going to be interesting to see if it does change in the near future. Yeah, it does seem like at least sentiment wise with the cost of tuition and parents are less concerned about their children going to college. But, you know, some of that could be an air of privilege, too, of like, oh, they'll be fine without college because yeah. getting into these fields still does require those connections unless there is a complete overhaul in how hiring managers look at filling these roles. Yeah, definitely. It's not an easy question. I, I think like if I were a parent of a, of a college age kid, I would have a really difficult time. I mean, I don't think the idea that college is the best way forward is going to go away anytime soon. And I think it should obviously be a path that people have the opportunity to get if that's the path they want to take. I think the issue is that we've created this system probably over the last few decades where it's really the only viable way to get a lot of good jobs. And I think that's the part that bears some uh, reevaluating. And, and I think we are, as a society, reevaluating that to some degree. That's a good point that it's a way, it's a valuable way. You know, you want your doctor to go to medical school. You need to get a law degree to practice law. Like there are some fields that you absolutely need higher education for. And journalism and other kind of knowledge-based work certainly has a set of skills. You detail in the book in an impressive amount how self-taught you are and your wife as well, who also didn't go to college and taught herself graphic design. You make a great point. It's a way forward, but we've set it up in the manner that it's almost impossible to not have that way forward. Totally. And I think that w with journalism in particular, it's a vital question because journalism is really about who gets to tell stories about the world, who gets to help people understand the world. And when we limit who can do that, um, we have a real problem with access and with the stories that do get told. I think we all know that journalism is not as diverse as it should be for a range of reasons. And I, and I think that part of that is the, the sort of barrier to entry in the field. Yes, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I 100% agree. And that's kind of been my like galvanizing force. I've talked about it on the show before. I came from a working class background. And I think it's a Barbara Eichenreich quote that's like the only people that can afford to write about poverty are rich people. And <laughs> that's a great quote. <laughs> but isn't it true? This is like the only yeah. people that can afford to tell these stories are the people that can come from privilege by and large, not completely. But yeah. but you need more diverse voices and diversity, meaning socioeconomical, racial, geographical, gender identity, every definition of diverse you need. To, to tell true stories. Otherwise, you're just telling the same stories from the same people and the same perspectives. I think that's why it's kind of so crucial, especially in journalism. I'm so glad that you, you brought that up. Yeah. And it's really probably the main reason I wrote the book. You know, I was just reading a lot about the education divide and about the value of a college degree. And every book had one thing in common and that it was written by college graduates, mm -hmm. which is fine. They should be able to write about it, too. But it seemed like every book was either written by someone who went to Harvard or Yale or, you know, an Ivy League school. And I thought to myself, people like myself who didn't go to school, we have opinions on it, too. We have thoughts about it, too. And it affects us. And we should be able to also write about this topic. And so that was the beginning of it. And, um, you know, I hope people find the, the perspective valuable and at least a little bit different. For me, whenever I read about middle of America, Midwestern, working class people written by, again, the same kind of, for lack of a better term, like coastal elite, <laughs> it's that same sort of grading. Like there are smart people in the Midwest. Why don't you have them write about it rather than somebody, you know, helicoptering in? And you kind of got at this a bit. You know, you were working as a professional journalist in the elite industries during several presidential elections. And it was especially in the, the 2016 election, which is when you first started working at Fast Company, where the, quote, uneducated white working class voters were blamed for electing Trump. And you wrote that feeling worried and knew that you would be found out <laughs> and and I, loved, <laughs> I love this line and saying that you wanted to scream, no, not all of us, because that's exactly yeah. how I feel. Yeah. And you wrote 
that it's only acceptable to be proud of your working class roots once you've left them behind. Obviously, this is something I very much relate to. But it's interesting that even after you had kind of long left them behind, you still didn't feel like you had. Is this kind of generalizations impacted how you report on similar quote unquote trends? Yeah, I mean, because I never really felt stable. And, you know, we, we work in an industry, we see what happens every day in our business. I mean, you see BuzzFeed News or, you know, Vox laying off, you know, a large percentage of their workforce. It doesn't feel like a stable industry, even if you have the best of credentials. And so in my case, I always felt like I was just one layoff away from being right back where I started. And I, I couldn't necessarily have this attitude of like, say, Anthony Scaramucci, who went to Harvard and, and now calls himself working class, but is a clearly not in the working class at present. So somebody like that who can say he left it behind. I never really felt like I left it behind because I feel like I'm kind of like just one layoff away from being in that same situation that I was in when I first started. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel that that speaks to kind of like a legacy of financial instability that I don't know. I think we also <laughs> both didn't do ourselves any favors by by choosing an industry that's so volatile. And I certainly feel that same way too of like, I've worked through past recessions and layoffs and like, okay, if it comes again, like I know what it's like. You fear that every job is your yeah. last and it comes with that lack of a safety net kind of follows you around. To that point of the way that white uneducated voters elected Trump was written about, Obviously, we both kind of bristle against that classification, but do you find yourself bringing some more nuance or looking at reporting those demographics or those trends differently? Yeah, I do. And I, and I did at the time. I mean, right, immediately when that narrative sort of took hold in, in the early Trump era, I felt like there were stories that needed to be told about the outliers. We live in New York City, so most people here obviously didn't vote for Trump. And if you walk the streets, most people you see didn't vote for Trump. I mean, that's just statistically speaking. Obviously, some do. But for this this whole uh, early 2016 era, when that was sort of the narrative, I think that that narrative was overly simplistic. I think research has now shown that that was an overly simplistic narrative. But um, at the time, it really felt like there was a kind of pigeonholing of the white uh, non-college educated voter as if every single person who was white and didn't go to college voted for Trump. That was not true. And at the time, I felt like it was a story that could have been told. I also felt like I was too scared to tell it because I was, you know, in a new job. I didn't want to go outing myself as someone who didn't complete college. So I just didn't say anything. Yeah, it's so interesting that kind of dynamic because in one way you're in a position where you finally can help control that narrative and bring that diversity of experience to storytelling and what needs to get told but on the other hand you were anxious that you didn't want to be outed and you wanted to make the good impression in your job i mean i hope now you, you are outed you've outed yourself that you you know can bring to our coverage and i think you do that challenging of that narrative because it is kind of like an easy, lazy way that the media kind of falls back on on these stereotypes. Yeah, definitely. And I think every journalist can challenge their own biases in different ways. I mean, I think that goes with the job. Every storyteller should really ask themselves when they sit down to write a story is like, where are my blind spots? You're not going to find them all, obviously, because we all have them. But you, you got to try to look for them. So you mentioned in the book how your wife thought that you were underestimating what your salary should be for much of your career. And it was another point that I related on. I remember thinking for an embarrassingly long time that $100,000 was the most literally any person could make. Like that's what the top executive jobs paid. It seemed that for a while you kind of did underestimate like one, what roles should pay, but two, kind of your own worth. And you said that you felt that you couldn't ask for more even after you had worked in a place for a long time and you'd been promoted. Why was that? Once you kind of figured it out and you were established, were you putting more value in a college degree than in your own workplace experience? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that probably that's a combination of the, the feeling of not quite being good enough to be doing the job that I was doing, but also maybe there's a, a sort of personality element to it. I don't think I'm a great negotiator for my own, <laughs> my own, uh, you know, my own needs anyway. So like, I've never negotiated for a higher salary. I always just take what they offer. And that's terrible advice. I mean, yeah. we, if you read Fast Company, every other story talks about how like, you know, you're supposed to negotiate for what you're worth. And, and I, I've really never done that. And I think maybe at, to your point, I think part of it had to do with just not feeling um, like 
like I really had the credentials to be doing what I was doing. So I just felt lucky to be doing it. And that's kind of the Kool-Aid that we're served too, right? Is like a million people would die to have this job. You're lucky just to have it. And that, you know, happens in creative industries. But to your point of every other (laughs) story on Fast Company is about (laughs) negotiation, a little hyperbole there. But yes, it's true that I didn't know about negotiation. I didn't do it earlier in my career because I didn't know it was a thing. Like I didn't know you were allowed to do it. Nobody had ever talked to me about negotiations. And, you know, and I didn't start actually negotiating until I started covering it as a topic at business publications. I'm like, oh, this is what people do in their careers. But that's another kind of thing, a value maybe of a college education or of going through these certain networks and being part of this certain world that are not on the curriculum of your college degree, but that you are taught. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that, you know, just coming into the business the way I did with not a lot of experience and and really no guidance, um, I did have to learn a lot of that stuff as I went along. I had an editor at one point at one of my jobs basically pull me aside and say, you're underpaid by about $20,000 a year. And I think you should just know that. It's up to you what you want to do with that information. And I appreciated that someone did that because I had no idea. It's a little bit easier nowadays with all the information that's online to probably get a better assessment of your value. But, you know, at one time it was not that easy. You really had to know people and and had to sort of ask around. You had to ask colleagues what they were getting paid. Yeah. When the the editor said that to you, what did you do with that information? Nothing? (laughs) I didn't do anything. Yeah, that was it. I was like, oh, it's good to know. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. My dawning (laughs) came when I found out that somebody who had a job under me got paid more than me. And then I was like, what? Because it's that same sort of thing. One, if you don't come from a privileged background and you think $100,000 is the most money executives make, then you're like, oh, this $30,000 job in New York City is a great deal until you find out, no, it's actually not a great deal. But then too, yeah. you, like, you don't even know the concept of negotiation. So there, I think there is so much about being in these worlds that are valuable job skills and career skills that are not actually things that you are taught in college, but are you know really unfair if you do want a diverse workforce to set up a system that is this sort of like in club. Yeah, totally. And I think the salary transparency movement has helped in this regard. I've had People ask me what I make, you know, at work, and I tell them, I, I think that you should be, if it's going to help someone else negotiate what they think they're worth, I think it's it's better that we share. I don't necessarily think it all has to be out on some website somewhere that, you know, Christopher Zara makes XYZ, um, you know, a year. But like, I think that if colleagues want to know how much you make and if the information will help them, I think you should definitely share it. Yeah, totally. I think so, too. And I think, you know, you're right. It it does feel like kind of a lot of the struggles that you've had and that a lot of other people have had are maybe getting better with this, you know, newer generation. They're like figuring the things out that we kind of bumbled through for a long time. Yeah, definitely. And they have they have access to information in ways that we just didn't. Um, They have access to networks in ways that we didn't 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, in, you know, it's a similar thing. You know, in your book, you talked about your your colleagues' efforts to unionize at International Business Times, as well as a job candidate from your previous job who wrote you a note saying you shouldn't put up with the treatment from your horrible boss. But in both of those instances, you were kind of hesitant to believe that you deserved more. Yeah. You had that kind of like, you should be happy to have a job mentality. That's an ethos that I've certainly felt as earlier in my career. It was certainly kind of something that I remember I had a really bad boss at my first job in high school. I worked in retail and I complained to my mom about it. And she's like, well, find another job. You can't quit a job until you have another job. Like you just have to put up with it sort of thing. Um, That was totally my mentality as well, especially being in media in New York City. I just assumed, well, of course, there are going to be people like this. And of course, they're all probably like this. So where am I going to go? Like to some other job and it's going to be the same way. Yeah. And I think to my mom's point that she kind of drilled into me is like, well, you need to have a job. So if you don't like it, find a different one. But you never quit a job. You don't leave a paycheck. Yeah. My dad would have been the exact same way. (laughs) He would have been like, well, they're paying you. What are you worried about? And I was like, I'm 17 years old. I don't, this is what I have to put up with. But what do you think, you know, to that, your response to your colleagues trying to unionize at your previous job and to that job candidate who wrote you the note was like, no, I should be happy to have a job. 
So what do you think is behind this kind of current uptick in the labor movement and the kind of general pushback we've been covering from employees? Do you think it comes from a place of youth, a place of privilege, both, something else? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I do think it's definitely the the rise in uh, unionization is something that I noticed in my own industry in digital media, I guess about I don't know, maybe maybe eight years ago, when we were at International Business Times trying to unionize, it was a new thing in digital media. Gawker had just done it, and it was basically unheard of in the industry. So it took me by surprise. And because I was so new and just getting my own footing, like I didn't see the value in it in the beginning. I thought to myself, like, we should just be working and trying to <laughs> stay uh, stable in, a, in an industry that didn't seem very stable. I see it differently now and after several years of watching these campaigns rise, it does feel like a real movement has taken foot. I think to answer your question of whether it's just youth or privilege, I think these kinds of movements are probably always going to be a little bit more, um, you know, they're always going to start with young people because young people come into the world and they're seeing injustice for the first time and they want to change things. The other question is whether or not it'll be a, a, this sort of like swinging pendulum kind of a thing where in 10 years we might see the opposite effect where there's a new wave of young workers who don't want to unionize. I mean, who knows? It seems like it was obviously started before the pandemic, but the pandemic really kind of pushed a reckoning of what you're tangled up your job and your identity and kind of calling that out as an unhealthy and what work should really look like. Yeah. You know, I do think it can be unhealthy to tie your your identity to your job. I also think it's perfectly normal to want to do that to some extent. I mean, I feel like it's just the language we use. Like, what do you do for a living? Like, it's just such a natural thing to ask someone. Yeah, it is. And to think of it in a in a broader way, we've thought so much about what we owe to our jobs, but to think about like what our jobs, you know, owe to us. Yeah. And I'm glad we're having the, the discussion because there, there are definitely, it, it's out of balance. You know, you see these mass layoffs at a company like Disney, for example, and you you look at how much their CEO gets paid and you, you do ask yourself, what could change that could make it a little bit more fair? Yeah. And does Iger really need to take home that, you know, many, so many millions of dollars every year? And can, can some of that get funneled back into the rank and file workers? Yeah, I always think that with with those layoffs is that's a person's entire livelihood, everything to them. And it's like an accounting error for you. It's a business trip. It's a, you know, like when when the disparity between the two things. Yeah. Yeah. And and the collateral damage when Disney lays off 7000 people and all the companies they work with. I mean, it's insurmountable when you start to try to calculate how much damage that does to people's lives, to people's working lives and their careers. Yeah, 100 percent. You and I have both been there with with layoffs and like, you know, how it uproots your life. Yeah. So you now have been in a position for many years where you hire and manage people. How has your experience with gatekeepers in the past impacted your approach to being a gatekeeper yourself? Well, I I think about trying to be a good one. I'll start there because I don't know if I'm a great gatekeeper. I, I try every day when I hire freelancers, when I am in the position to be able to hire a writer here and there. I try to really think about if it was me starting out and, and, and that was my resume and someone was ready to dismiss, to dismiss it because it didn't have the college education on there, how could I do the search a little bit differently? Now, saying that, I find that, again, this is probably just a habitual thing, but like when we do put out calls for journalists and we put out calls for writers, you know, the vast majority of them are college-educated people. I don't really come into contact with too many, too many um, resumes that don't have a college education on them. It kind of gets back to your original question of what can employers do to to broaden their their networks a little bit. I, w- I wish I had the answer to that. I think that you're right. The larger question is broadening the outreach and going beyond the regular job boards, going beyond the regular universities that people, you know, that a lot of employers recruit from. Um, but from a hiring manager perspective, at least one thing I've done is read every resume. <laughs> You know, not, and I think you, I know that you do this too. You know, when you get 250 resumes, you actually look at them all as opposed to kind of just going to your alumni network sort of thing or like, who do we know or who have we worked with in the past? And I think also, right, like looking for 
transferable skills. So our industry is so much about like what publications have you written for before, where are your clips from? If you've done this exact same work before, then you'll get this job. But somebody has to be that first person that gives you a chance. Yeah. And this might sound trite, but I think for me, the cover letter is really a, a big part of it. Because if if someone can sit down and write a decent cover letter, and I, and I don't mean like a, a form letter, but something creative, something that they're applying for a job as, as a writer. So you want to be able to see that skill right up front. You want to hear their voice in, in the cover letter. Now, granted, this is all changing very rapidly with chat GPT and, and some of these new technologies that are out there. But for the time being, I still, I consider the cover letter to be really important when you're talking about a, a job as a writer. I agree. And I'm glad that you said that because we did have a debate when chat GPT was just starting out and people were experimenting with using it for things like cover letters. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, yeah, I hate cover letters. They're so useless. Like, of course, yeah. we, you know, nobody reads them. Of course, we, you know, use uh, AI to write it for you. And, you know, we might be you and I might be in the minority that says, like, no, I actually really value the cover letter and read it and think that you should put some thought and effort into it if you legitimately want the job, because it's the place that your personality shows. You know? Yeah, that, that's yeah. exactly right. It's your one chance to tell the, the future possible employer, this is who I am. If nobody walks away from this podcast with anything else, it's the value of the <laughs> cover letter, if you ever want to get hired by one of the two of us, I guess. And if you can use the chat GPT to fool people, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to say do it or don't do it, but <laughs> for you, you got to you got to still have one. I mean, but then you're hiring a robot for the job. You're not hiring that person. That's be, true. Yeah, you'll, the you'll be found out job. pretty fast because when you're writing on the job, you can't secretly have the robot do it. I, maybe you can. I don't know. Yeah. So you asked the question in the book, did you fail the school system or did it fail you? And you kind of reckon with the answer. Do you feel that it was one or the other or a bit of both? Do you think that things have changed in the public education system since you left school? Um, I do think it was a little bit of both. I think every person's story is different. And in my case, if I really look back and do an audit of what happened, the school made a lot of mistakes. They were overcrowded. They didn't want to deal with someone who had some behavior problems. And then there was my own parts where I was responsible for my own behavior and for mouthing off to teachers and doing some of the things that I did and sort of asking to be treated in in the way that I was treated. I don't know if the school system has gotten any better. I can tell you that, you know, I mentioned in the book I was classified as emotionally disturbed, which is a, an official classification in special education that no one likes. Um, no one thinks it's especially useful, but it's used and it's still used today. And I think the definition is still pretty much the same as it was when it first came into official usage. It was based on some research that happened in California, I think in the 50s or 60s, and then it found its way into federal law. And it's used now as a classification, emotionally disturbed, like it's a terrible name, but that is something that really I don't think has gotten better because I think they still use that and I think they still classify kids as emotionally disturbed. And I think that based on that classification, they then put them into certain circumstances that might not be the best for their education. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think either one of us is expert enough in the field of education to know exactly what's going on there, but it does feel like as far as, you know, you mentioned overcrowding and, you know, I think that that's still an issue where a teacher in a public school has, I think the legal limit is something like 28 or up, upper mm -hmm. 20s. And it is so hard to, you know, if a student needs something other than that form of, of education, if they need more attention or a different method of teaching, it's just those resources aren't available. And then those kids are slipping through the cracks. You are one of the most intelligent people I have ever worked with. It's not for lack of... Okay, you <laughs> It's not for lack... Well, you're a really good writer too. But it's not for, you know, like lack of knowledge or or will or any of those things. It's like we're losing kids that just kind of need something other than what what we have. Yeah, it's true. And I feel for I feel for teachers now. I really do. Like it's not easy. It's not an easy job and I think that my teenage self didn't quite see it the same way because I had this thick-headedness that a lot of kids have when they're 16 years old, but it's a tough job. I mean, it's probably the toughest job or one of the toughest jobs out there and you know, you're you're thrown into this situation. They don't give you a lot of resources. I remember when I first learned that teachers had to buy their own school supplies. I, I just was floored. I was like, really? They don't even 
do that for them. And but yeah, that's how it is. We've talked about this on the show before. It's just so wild that how well funded your school is is based on the property values of the houses in your town. So like there are some school districts that they're really well funded because the people who live there are wealthy and then they have good PTOs that help buy them the school supplies are well funded, all of those things. It's just like a, a random randomness of circumstance. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like one of those what could go wrong kind of situations when you start to rate schools based on property value. Yeah, exactly. So imposter syndrome is kind of such a big theme of this book. And we've actually written about how Gen Z is less likely to have imposter syndrome. This youngest generation also seems to be a bit more willing to askew the idea that you need a college degree to be successful, as we talked about. What do you think that some of what you've experienced with feeling inadequate or encountering gatekeepers is changing? Or those attitudes that you can have only kind of come from a place of privilege, that feeling that not having imposter syndrome? Well, I do think that um, it's changing. I think it's changing for a few different reasons. I I don't want to just throw it all at TikTok, but when you think about a generation that accesses information in the way that Gen Z does and has for their entire lives, their sense of identity is going to be a lot different and possibly a, a lot more fluid than ours was. You know, they are just exposed to so many different viewpoints at such a young age. So maybe that factors into it. And then the point about college, I think, you know, because the millennial generation especially has been saddled with so much of this college debt, there there possibly is a sort of reevaluation of that with younger people now looking at their older millennial siblings or maybe even their parents that still have the college debt and asking themselves if they want to go down that same path. Yeah, that's true. I, I think it's like the shine has worn off a little bit maybe. Yeah. So, okay, this is my last question. I could go on and on and on. But in the book, this is kind of towards the end of the book, you mentioned what was perhaps Fast Company's most famous cover. In 2007, we had a cover of Mark Zuckerberg in the early days of Facebook. And the cover lines are hacker, dropout, CEO. You go on to outline other superstar dropouts. These are, as you point out, stories that we love. But you say for every Mark Zuckerberg, there are millions of people without the means or advantages or opportunities to choose school. It feels much like the value that we place on higher education in the professional world speaks more of class and pedigree than actual education. What are your feelings on the way that we consider these kind of connotations of the the word, the dropout label? Um, I have a lot of feelings about the word dropout, and I think that they've changed over the years. With Mark Zuckerberg in particular, you know, he sort of personifies the superstar dropout myth. And I think I say in the book, to compare someone who left Harvard to run his billion-dollar startup with someone who drops out of school because they don't have the emotional guidance or support to even continue or finish, it's not a fair comparison. There are two totally different things, and yet they get lumped in to the same category based on this one word. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg didn't drop out of anything. He left school to run a company. and He's one of the richest people on the planet. So I I think that, like, I I have mixed feelings about it. I also understand why these superstar dropout stories are so appealing. Like, we love the idea that someone can, you know, make it without the traditional education. It's sort of like the ultimate FU, right? You can say, I can do it my way and I can succeed and I don't need the traditional institutions that people so often need. I think it kind of helps helps us with our, our myth of the American dream too, right? It's like, oh, look, everybody can be Mark Zuckerberg. But, but as you point out, a dropout of an Ivy League college is not yeah. the same as a dropout of a public high school in New Jersey. And they don't have the same opportunities. They don't necessarily end up in the same place. Most likely, they don't end up in the same place. And yes, for every Mark Zuckerberg, there are millions of people who dropped out who are struggling to pay their bills. Yeah, and the sad thing is, like it was in my case, when you're someone who who did you didn't go to school and didn't really have the opportunity to further their education, like you do look at those stories and you think to yourself, well, if you know if they can do it, I can do it too. And you know, there's a fallacy there. Like you kind of are drawn to, I think, in a way, the wrong myths. Yeah. Well, um, I will end it there, and I will say, Christopher's book is out May sixteenth. It is called Uneducated, a memoir of flunking out, falling apart, and finding my worth. And I read it cover to cover. I highly recommend that everybody read it wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. 
Kate, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Work is changing every day. What's the most pressing issue on your mind? Email us at podcast at fastcompany.com or tweet us with the hashtag The New Way We Work. The New Way We Work is produced by Joshua Christensen and Julia Shu with editing by Nicholas Torres. 